If you want to understand how to be rich, I'll teach it to you in about two minutes. So I can't see anyone in the world that's ever going to say, gee, 400%, I don't want that. My books. <laughs> which one? Which one specifically? You're, right, now let's talk about the different types of wealth. Business is really about creating an asset that works without you to create massive cash flow. You don't change your life 100% by one idea, you change your life 100% by 100 ideas that are 1%. So guys, what is wealth? Have you got it? Have I got it? Are there different types of wealth? Well, let's find out because this is part three of three with Brad Sugars. And this session is all about maximizing your wealth for you and your family. Let's do this. Right, Brad Sugars, let's talk about wealth. What is it? Uh, original definition of wealth that served me really well was Buckminster Fuller's definition, which was the ability to live a number of days forward. Meaning if I stopped working right now, how many days forward can I live at my current lifestyle without working? Interesting. Yeah. So it's like, until that number is infinite, you got to keep working type thing. And so most people do the 40, 40, 40 plan, 40 years, 40 hours a week to retire on 40% of what they made during that period of time. And so and, and it was, I remember watching, dang, I forget how old I was, probably 10 or 11 as a kid. I remember this TV ad, which was like a financial ad of some sort. And it was, the guy walks in the house and he says to his wife, yep, Doc says I'm fit as a fiddle. I'm going to live till I'm 90. And she looks at him with this really worried look on her face, but, but we can't afford for you to live till you're 90. And that stuck in my head as... What do, you, what do you mean you can't afford to live to your 90 type thing? And it was like the whole idea of people are outliving their pension is a massive thing. It's why pension funds around the world are going bankrupt because, you know, A, they've ruined the money or spent the money on stupid things, but there's just no ability to support the longevity of life. And that's why people are working a lot later in life and they don't create wealth. What they create is an income stream that they spend every single month and they get to the end of their working time and their only real asset is their house if they've got one of those um so yeah that's where the challenge falls in quite like the framework though the 40 40 40 now is that a good framework or the best that's the framework? worst framework possible uh, but how common is that but, but it's what we were taught no well not everybody's taught that you well, know because in the 1950s is in the 1950s now i forget the author's name they wrote a book about working for the man right you know, and it was this whole thing of, you, in the 1950s, they taught that to, your job is to get a job where you'll work for the rest of your life. And the company takes care of you. And that philosophy pervaded right through. And because they'd had the 1930s and the crisis and all of that sort of stuff, this seemed to make sense to people that this is what you should be doing. You should be working for the big company and They'll take care of you. They'll pay you your pension. You know, you'll get your lifelong service medal and all of those sorts of things. I mean, that's the retirement age over here now is what, 67, something like that. It's not 40. Well, the retirement age is going to keep going up and up and up. There's no two ways about that. Um, and that's not through anything other than people don't understand money. Like, let me give you an example of two countries that have thought about this. So in Malaysia, where we employ people, uh, we have to put in, I forget the exact percentages, Singapore is 21 or 22 and 20%. We have to put in 20% of their salary into a savings fund and they have to put in 20% of their salary into a savings fund. So the government insists that people save money and invest that money. They're allowed to invest it in their own home. They're allowed to invest it into the stock market, in the share market. Uh, they're not allowed to short the market in Singapore, which is an interesting one. Malaysia does the same sort of philosophy so you've got the Australian government that has a, a, a superannuation system which is based on 11% of the salary of someone being put into a lifelong investment fund. They're making people do this so that they know it's there uh, later on in life. But what, what we've been taught is the philosophy of money that you get a job, you work, you pay your mortgage, and yes. this is where the millennials... Millennial generation are looking at it differently. They're saying, I don't want a mortgage. I don't want to go through what my parents went through. I'm happy to pay rent, but I don't want to go through what my parents went through of, you know, the, and 
2000, 2008. They've seen all of these generational shifts of money that they don't want to deal with that stuff. They want lifestyle more than owning your own home and doing all of that sort of stuff. So it's changing the shape of... Are we in a wealth or a lifestyle revolution right now? Oh, we're definitely in a lifestyle revolution uh, in the way that the world is. But we're also... I mean, we've got to go way back. If you want to understand money, you go back to turn of the century where it was an agrarian age majority, right? The world was agrarian age. Well, who won the agrarian age? Basically, the British won the agrarian age, okay? They owned the most land in the world, India, Australia, Canada, tried to take the US. The US said, we don't want to pay taxes. Everyone says it was about freedom. No, it wasn't. It was about not paying taxes. Hence, the Boston Tea Party. We're throwing the tea overboard instead of paying taxes, right? So from the agrarian age, we went into the industrial age. Now, the U.S. won the first part of the industrial age because they invented things like uh, petrol, cars, Mm -hmm. steel. uh, Like the steel, just the invention of steel to create a bridge that connected the country sort of thing. Those things are just phenomenal. Electricity was phenomenal. Whoever got there first is... Yeah, and that's where the U.S. won a lot of that part of the industrial age. And then the Japanese won the second part of the industrial age because they went into the TQM, Total Quality Management, uh, the Deming philosophy. It became the best... Con- they became the best at making things in the world. And sort of quality thing. management. Uh, total Quality Management. Uh, w. Edwards Deming. Now... That, here's the challenge though, we then move into the information age and we've got the US makes movies, the Japanese made VCRs or DVDs at the time, right? So the movies that are made here, you make a movie once, you can sell it forever and ever and ever and ever. You make a DVD player once, you sell it once. So the Americans with Silicon Valley and Hollywood are winning the information age in the world, okay? Now that being said, massive money shift right now because... India, China, they're all in moving from the agrarian age into the industrial age. So you've got these massive markets where like India is in a baby boom right now because of the fact that uh, electricity and refrigeration 30 and 50 years ago spread across the country. So therefore you end up with this massive baby boom. The millennial generation is more than 50% of the population, whereas China, America, Japan, England, all aging out Mm -hmm. sort of thing. So less, you've got the population growth parts of the world and the population decline parts of the world. So that's a real interesting understanding. And I think that until you see the macroeconomics of what the world is, and, you know, I studied macroeconomics at school and it didn't make any sense, but until you start studying and seeing what's going on with the world, you know, when people look at the whole Russia invading and all of these sorts of things and you start to understand, well, hang on, China and Russia are both net importers on food products. What does that mean? That means that if the world turns to challenging, Russia and China are going to run out of food. Now, they're not only importers of food, they're net importers of food production products. So the machinery, the big one, fertilizer, so Brazil's really in trouble right now because Russia being at war and Russia has one of the world's worst uh, systems of, of moving things around. It's based on a trucking system, let alone the train system, not non-existent type thing. But we sit down and we start to understand what that impacts. It means that probably China's going to be economically smashed in the next 10 to 20 years. Russia, if those oil pipelines freeze over again because of this war next the next winter, then they're going to be smashed again. Brazil, if they can't get fertilizer, because Russia is the biggest producer of fertilizer, if they can't get fertilizer, they've only got one, two years of topsoil left. They need fertilizer to grow. So there's, there's a lot of challenges with the economics of the world or the macroeconomics. Now, once you understand some of that, and again, it's just reading that gets you to the, un- to the point of understanding that, and even listening to podcasts and that sort of thing, where you start to understand the macroeconomics of wealth, then you can start to plan and budget for your microeconomics of wealth and what is wealth to you and how does wealth become a part of your psyche and, and what you do. do you, does one need to go and learn about this stuff to understand it and understand wealth creation for myself? No. Now I need to understand it to teach it. Right. So to teach people how to be wealthy, I need to have all of that knowledge base to see where it comes from and why it ends up being there. 
So if I go back to the agrarian age gets one, the industrial age gets one, now we're moving back into that industrial age. That's why we're seeing multi-millionaires coming out of Mexico and India and all of these other markets that are entirely different to everywhere else in the world. Now, the reason I do say that, though, is that if you're going to become a millionaire, where do you want to be selling things? You want to be selling things where the majority of it is being sold. How many telephones are sold in India every month? How many new swimming pools? How many doors? How many tables? All the things that moving from uh, uh, from poverty into middle class changes. China, uh, India, all that. That's why I, I do bet on India. I talk about India a lot because I think they're very well positioned in the world you, economics. You, you've just shared something really good, though. You do the reading and the research so that I don't need to do it. <laughs> which I still think you want to do it, though. Yeah, well, uh, I'll, I'll do the, some of the other things. You want to understand how to be rich? I'll teach it to you in about two minutes. Uh, right, two minutes starts now. On your marks, get set, go. Uh, build a business that gives you enough money every year to buy to place a deposit on one piece of property. Rent out that piece of property on a 20-year mortgage. 20 years later, you're rich. Do that with 20 houses or 10 if you don't want to be super rich, 20 if you want to be super rich, and you're done. Wasn't even two minutes. No, it wasn't. It was like... 20- See, why is real estate the number one producer of wealth in the world, James? Is it? I'm, I'm going to ask you a question here. Why is real estate the number one producer of wealth in the world? Passive. Okay. No. Let's go back a step. Because businesses create the income. Banks lend against income. People go, oh, I'm going to buy an investment property. I'll get it at 80% value. Therefore, I'll get the loan. No, no. Banks lend against income, not against the value of the asset. So I buy a house. And let's just, for argument's sake, let's say the house is a million, right? So easy math then, right? One million for the house. 200 grand needs to be paid as a deposit. Now, in some markets, you're going to need 300 grand. Other markets, you're going to need 50 grand. But on average, you're going to need 20% of the value of the property to buy that piece of property. Yep. Real estate is 20% down, 80% borrowed, right? Who pays the 80%? The person you're renting it out to. The tenant. Yeah. The tenant doesn't pay rent. They pay the mortgage. Mm-hmm. So over 80 years, that person pays that... Uh, so over 20, 20 years, years, that person pays that mortgage for me. So at the end of 20 years' time, I own it outright. Now, to make this really simple, you got young kids, right? Imagine when your kids were one, you went and bought a house for each child at one year old, 20% deposit down. 20 years later on their 21st birthday, the mortgage is fully paid off. You give that kid that house. It's probably worth a lot more money. It doesn't matter if it's worth a lot more money because here's the trick. You put in 20%. You get full value of it 20 years later. What is your return over 20 years? What's your percentage return? 400%. 400%. Four times. You made a 400% return over 20 years. I can't see anyone in the world that's ever going to say, gee, 400%, I don't want that. And, and like people are just, and, and it's probably doubled or tripled in value over that 20 years, okay? Especially if you didn't buy in the, like the middle of the country where there's just so much land, it's not funny. If you bought anywhere near the outside edges of a country or close to a city, it's going to have, have gone up. And again, that's doing research and doing learning. You've got to understand that stuff. But if someone's going to pay for 80% of it, let's say I said to you tomorrow, James, you can buy Amazon shares. Buy as many Amazon shares as you have 20% deposit for. And in 20 years' time, I'll give you all of those Amazon shares fully paid off. Would you buy them? Of course you would. Why don't people do that with real estate? It blows my mind why people aren't buying more and more real estate every day. What stops people doing it? Or they heard from their brothers, uncles, next door neighbors, best friends, sister that oh no, real estate's a bad investment. I, I think there's more than that. I, I think, lost money on real estate. I, mean, I think there's. Didn't got, you hear about the housing crisis? Yeah. Oh, but someone had a tenant, and the tenant lit a fire in it, and and, and it, like, Pain. you know what actually stops people, James? Real simple thing. They just can't be bothered. Comfort. They can't be bothered. I want to be rich, but I don't. I don't need to be rich. No I, don't, I don't have to do it. I'm not actually going to do it. I want to lose weight. I'm not actually going to do it. There's no discipline. What if you joined a group of, of real estate investors and you had to turn up to a meeting every single week and you had to discuss whatever you did that week for the next... Yeah, then you'd start doing things. Why? There's more pressure to do it than not do it. One of your models that you showed once on a, in, in a session was a diagram and, and you said the magic happens in the middle. And... I think there was three, three circles that were overlapping. So one of them was your intention. So people have got intentions to buy a house. You know, you can all have the intention. The second, though, you, you, you said you've got to give it attention. Uh-huh. You've got to attend to this. You've got to do some stuff with it. 
And then the third thing you said was the skills. Mm-hmm. You got to have skills to be able to deal with it and and develop it. And that's where the magic is. That why people don't do it. Well, I mean, how many years did it take you to learn to do your job, right? So let's say you went to school, you went to college, you then you even got a job. You still didn't even know what you're doing the first four or five years type thing, right? Same is going to be true for real estate investing. It's going to take you two, three, four, five years to learn. You don't expect to learn it in one day. And, and people do. They want this short time frame. I want to go to a weekend course on real estate and then just be rich. It doesn't work that way. It just doesn't. It works of over your lifetime, you become an expert at something and you build it and you become great at it and you get to know more and more about it. And, you know, unless you've read a dozen books on the subject of investing in real estate, don't expect to even know how to write a plan on it. I, I, I do like that. Uh, the, there's another model here, high patience, high effort. It goes for recruiting as well, isn't it? Recruiting people. But you, that in, in your investment in wealth and properties, etc. Well, your first investment is knowledge. It doesn't matter if, if you're going to buy a business, you should invest in knowledge before buying the business. If you're going to invest share market, you should invest in knowledge before buying shares. You should invest in knowledge before buying real estate. Knowledge comes first. Second comes buying the actual investment piece. People go on, oh, my buddy gave me a tip on a stock. Well, it's the same as my buddy gave me a tip on a horse. You know that shortcut oh. that you were talking about, people, the easy life, the one to get rich Some quick. people do. They're not watching our podcast, so maybe right, we should so, stop talking to them. Okay. So <laughs> let, 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 let's come back to then. Knowledge. Do people go and read the books? Most people do, yeah. Or they'll read the first chapter of the book at least. <laughs> it does give you energy that, you know, but yeah, I do like that overflow. Well, this is why I do love audio books because you complete them type thing. Someone, I don't know who, I don't know where this came from, but money loves speed, success loves speed. Doesn't like you to procrastinate on the book. It likes you to get the book but and read you, it. Your brain fights against speed of change. Right. The human brain, John Ashraf talks about it in his book, uh, what's it called? Inner Size. The, the human brain doesn't want change. It wants safety. It wants security. Almost, yes, yes. So it wants you to stay the same. So you're going to have to change over a period of time, not over a period of days. Again, if it took you 10 years, James, to learn how to be an amazing investor in property, it took you 10 years. You didn't even buy one piece of real estate in that 10 years. If you're sitting in front of me at age 30 or so and saying, okay, I'm going to wait till I'm, I'm going to just keep studying. Mm-hmm. And by age 40, you sit down and go, I got it. And at 40, you start investing. Then by 60, you're rich. But when people sit there and go, I'm going to study real estate this year. No, it takes three years to do a degree course minimum, four and five years in most schools these days. So if you want to do a real estate course, good. Study for five years. Then come and tell me how you're going to do it. Where do people start? My books. (laughs) Which one? Which one specifically? Real estate coach, wealth coach, billionaire in training, my 30X wealth training program. I got all of them out there, but... It's not just me, buddy. There's a million great teachers on this subject. Yeah, and you hit me here, Brad. But you start at the bookstore. That's where you start. You yeah. start at Amazon.com. Look up books on real estate investing. Yeah, but hang around and get the right coaches. and Go, you know, you, and, go and get a coach. Go and attend courses. Go and join. Think of it as a hobby. If you were to take up a new hobby, model airplanes, what would you do? Well, you'd go to the model airplane store. You'd go and hang out with other model airplane people. You'd go and find someone that could teach you. You'd join a model airplane club. You'd go watch model airplanes fly on the weekends. You'd start reading model airplane magazine. You get the point, right? You'd join podcasts. You'd join, you'd join, you'd join. Love the fuck. Te- treat it as a hobby and all will be fine. Treat your own wealth creation as a hobby. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. And create a business. The business is called, your name, Wealth Limited, or a trust, depending upon where you're at in the world. Okay, I'm not giving financial advice here. Can we make sure that rider is on the thing? You, you need to set up an entity that is your family wealth entity. It has to have bank accounts. It has to have, it has to have, right? So then you build a business plan. 
So the Vincent Family Wealth Company Trust, whichever it is, the Vincent family sit down and write a business plan. And that business plan says, we will invest in these things here. We'll invest in real estate if it meets these rules and fits this niche. We'll invest business that meets these rules and this niche. We'll invest in the stock market if it meets these rules and this niche. These are the things. We're going to keep 10% over here for harebrained schemes. That is stupid, dumbass <laughs> ideas that come up at a bar one night. Harebrained schemes. Yeah, harebrained schemes. We're going to invest 10% of it in NFTs and cryptocurrencies and other stupid shit that comes along and comes and goes, right? We're going to throw 10% of our wealth into dumb shit, okay? We're going to have a percentage of our wealth in real estate, a percentage in business, a percentage in the stock market. Now... If you can write that business plan, what are we going to buy in business? What are our rules to buy? What are our rules of not to buy? And rules are very important. What niche will we participate in? Same for real estate, same for shares. If you can write that business plan, then you have enough knowledge to invest. Until you can write that business plan, you don't have enough knowledge to invest. So take two, three years writing that wealth business plan and then start investing. While you're, while you're writing it, put your money into a damn CD for all I care. Just put it somewhere. So the starting point, though, is three pages. It's free. You know, the, the pages on each one can go deeper, but you've got three headings there. Three subjects. Three yes. subjects. A so business got, plan. Yeah. Vincent Family Wealth. Yeah. One on property, one on business, and one in shares. Mm-hmm. You're, right, now let's talk about the different types of wealth. Clearly, financial is the type of wealth. I want to talk to you about financial wealth, intellectual wealth, social, and spiritual. Where do you want to start? Wherever you point me in that direction. Oh, well, let's well, we've been on financial, so let's just finish that yeah, one let's off. finish that off. Okay, so we go back to Bucky's definition. Financial is the ability to live a number of days forward, right? So your goal is to create an asset base with a cash flow that pays for your life whether you get out of bed or not. Mm -hmm. The number one methodology to do that is business. Business is number one. Now, remember, for something to be a financial investment, it must do two things. It must have capital growth and it must have cash flow. So capital growth and cash flow are the two prerequisites to define something as investment. Hence, uh, art, not an investment, doesn't have cash flow. Might have capital gain, but doesn't have cash flow. Airbrain scheme money over there, right? That's your 10% money. Go and do that with that. If I'm in business, I want to know what type of businesses I will buy, what type I won't buy. What are your rules around that? And again, it, it, if you have enough knowledge to know your rules, then you have enough knowledge to invest. So invest in knowledge until you get enough knowledge to build your plan. Business is really about creating an asset that works without you to create massive cash flow. Business is great cash flow. Amazing capital gains, but mm -hmm. also great cash flow. You want to always have at least one business in your portfolio so that you've always got something that gives you A, tax deductibility, and B, cash flow. Okay, Because if the, if the world goes to crap and economics hit a negative point, you want to make sure that you have cash flow. If you are asset rich and cash poor and the market turns, you have to sell your assets for below what you paid for them and you lose basically everything. So you've got to always have cash flow and cash and that sort of thing. Real estate is really about building capital value. So the more capital value you can create with real estate, the better it is. The stock market is about cashable capital value and cash flow. So you, the great thing about shares and the stocks is you can cash them out at any point in time. If you need cash, you can get cash. So you never have to worry about selling hard assets when you've got it. You've got enough cashables to be able to live through that period. All right, so there's financial. Which one's next? Hmm. Great wrap up there on financial. Let's go intellectual. What is intellectual wealth? Um, the ability to think for yourself. I think that's... Possibly, you know, when if you get this, uh, and I just I visited my daughter in Florence, and and we were going through this about the three stages of being a parent. Stage one is the kids think what you think. Stage two is about them thinking what their friends think, and stage three is getting to the point where they think about what they think. You know, it's where their third stage is: what do I actually think? What where do I want to vote? What do I believe in the world? 
world? Where do I want to live? What do I want? And, and like making their own decisions, defining who they are as a person themselves type thing. The, the intellect is someone who has done enough, seen enough, read enough to be able to fill in the jigsaw. Connect the dots. Fill in the jigsaw. Yeah. I like to put the four points out, make yeah, the yeah. outside rim, and then just build who you want to be. Now, here's the greatest thing about that. You build a new jigsaw about every seven to ten years. Is it ever expansive? You know, yeah, some... every, every seven to ten years, you reinvent yourself. You can go through a whole new career every seven to ten years. It's not hard. And, you know, becoming a vision of your future self and reinventing yourself, does that start with a decision on who you want to become in seven to ten? Who do I want to be? What, what do I want my legacy to be? What do I want to be known for in this lifetime? If, if I'm remembered, what am I going to be remembered for? And start building the jigsaw. Is every piece of the jigsaw, because we're talking about intellect here and wealth, is it depth of knowledge? Is it a, another book? Is it someone else that you're learning from? Is it a specific trait that you're developing? Can be all of those things. It can also be rereading a book that's a master of book. Yeah. Sometimes you're better off to re... I, I reread Michael Gerber's book, The E-Myth, probably 50 times when I first started in business before I got it. You know, maybe I'm a slow learner or maybe there's just so much in the book. But you, but look um, at, think and Grow Rich. I probably haven't reread it every year, but I've gone close to that. You know, there's so many great studies that sometimes it takes you better off to reread than to just read it one time. Um but what you find, and, and my wife and I do jigsaws on vacation all the time. We always buy a couple more thousand and three thousand piece jigsaws when we travel. When you've got 900 pieces in, the last hundred get a lot easier. Yeah. So true. Oh. So that's the way life works, is that the more pieces you've got, the easier that next piece of knowledge fits in and makes a finer distinction. Because here's one of the great pieces of knowledge about knowledge is it's not the major learnings that give us the biggest impact. It's those fine distinctions, those little twists where you go, huh, never thought of it that way. And then you go down that rabbit hole and you go, wow, that's amazing. The jigsaw analogy is amazing. And that whole critical mass point, you get to a point where it just starts getting easier and things are moving thicker and faster and mm -hmm. the last hundred pieces fall into place. What are some of the... What are some of the shifts that you've been through on intellectual wealth? Uh, I think the self-doubt one was the biggest one. Like people often ask, what would you do differently? And I always said I would have gone faster. Uh, as a young man, unfortunately, I doubted a lot of my own decisions and I slowed down a lot of my business growth because I didn't, I was like, I don't know if I'm on the right track or not. Let's just go a little slower here because I'm not sure if we're doing it the right way. And should have gone faster and should have should have done that. So I think that's the biggest one. Yeah, but then you hear in, in, in other books and different people, researchers and psychologists that talk about some of the most successful people on the planet, and you're, you're up there. So they're driven by self-doubt. They can, they can use doubt as a, as a driver. Yeah, but it's also a phase that you want to get through at some point in time. Yeah. You know, yeah. Because false of fear and self-doubt can not lead to good places, Napoleon Hill type things. Uh, are, there any, are there any sort of key learning points that you say that you've been through that this is, that's what I learned there and that's why I've been the success I've been? Well, I mean, there's so many of those, James. Um, but there's no one thing. That's the point of it. You don't change your life 100% by one idea, you change your life 100% by 100 ideas that are 1%. So, or 50 that are 2% type thing. It's not a one, one idea, the silver bullet, the white whale, the magic trick. No, it's, it's a lot of littles that keep you on track. I remember uh, Buzz Aldrin, he had a great quote. I, I got to go in the zero gravity jet with Buzz Aldrin one time and, you know, he's, he's, feeding me M&Ms up in the middle of the sky as we're floating through the air inside this big plane. And, and um, one of my favorite quotes of his is that, you know, you'll never always be on track. You'll always be self-correcting just a little bit, just a little bit. And I remember reading a story about that first time they went to the moon talking about uh, they were on track 3% of the time. You know, so you don't always be on track, but you'll be self-correcting a little bit here and there. What I've got from you constantly in this is, you know, that... 
hundred ideas versus one idea. It's just like it's a get out of jail card. That it's it's give it's like the opposite of self sabotage. This is just one of my things. Yeah, uh, there's a golfer recently who had a great BFO for me, a blinding flash of the obvious. They asked him as he was doing a round. He said, you know, what happened when you hit that shot? And he said, well, I have seven bad shots around, so that was just one of my seven. It was like, huh, that's an easy way to look at it. Like, I know I'm going to hit seven bad shots, so don't worry about it. Now I'm down to six. Accept it and move on. Yeah. There's a book there called Shut Up, Move On. It's just sumo, you know, we keep talking about books here, but this is intellectual wealth. It's depth of learning. So that's one thing that you've got. It's depth. And is that down to experience? Is that down to rigorous commitment of reading, hanging around the greats? What is it? All the above. It's just being a learner. I think it's part of your intention as well, though, isn't it? Because you spread yourself on personal business. And wealth. Well, I, I often joke, James, that I have to be rich because I teach wealth. You know, I have no choice. Foregone conclusion. Back to that subject. But we, but we've got breadth as well because there's three. Well, I love. I just love learning. I love learning, and if you don't love learning, don't become a teacher. I mean, that's pretty simple from that perspective. But if you are going to be able to outthink, outmaneuver. You've got to out-educate yourself. The, the whole learn before you earn thing is still real today. You have to be a learner. If, you, if My dad said it to me when I was a kid. He said, you can get paid from the neck up or the neck down. Neck up pays more. You know, you can be paid to lift things or to think about things. I'd rather think. Yeah, I mean, out-think, out-maneuver. You've got to out-educate yourself. That's a good mindset. That is healthy. I mean, that is, that's quite challenging. It's pushing Let's talk, about, let's talk about social. I know you've got some good opinions on this. So social wealth. What's that about? Family and friends. Connectivity. Humans. Humans cannot survive without other humans. That's why the worst people in the world are put in solitary. You know, humans need humans. Um, but social wealth is, to me, all about those relationships that you build. Um, and it, it's pretty clear that um, the more you care about others than yourself the more social wealth you get social wealth is by it's crazy that investing in like for wealth for finances you got to invest sort of thing it's the same with people you got to invest you just have to invest in people. You have to invest in others. And what is investing? I was very in happy the other day. I got a text from uh, two of my friends that I didn't know knew each other. Both sitting there one day. He goes, we're really both sitting here talking about how great it is to hang with sugars. And it's like, cool. I like that. You know, I like that that's the way my friends think. That's the way that, that they look at it sort of thing. And, um you know, I, I want to be known. I always say friendship is about two things, reaching out and showing up. If your friend has, if your friend has a kid's first birthday party and, you know, I've got five kids and we have a lot of friends and the number of first birthday parties I've been to, I'm 100 years old, I think. But if your friend has a first birthday party for their kid, that's a really important thing for them, so you show up. When your friend has a baby, you turn up with the cigar. You do those things. You friends show up, um, and the second is they reach out when you see a friend going through something, whether it's positive or negative. You reach out. You make the phone call. I remember my wife, Lauren, when we first started dating. In fact, we weren't even dating. We just we'd met and we had a bet on the Lakers and the Celtics, and it was my birthday. And everyone sends you a text or a Facebook or whatever she called me we weren't even dating we just met i turned to my buddy rob and i said dude you won't believe it this hot chick i met she called me for my birthday and he goes damn dude you should probably date her (laughs) and it was here we are married now you know it's like but that's that's really what social capital is and so we do things that we entertain a lot to make sure our friends are always together like 
some of our friends have said, I would never see other people if it wasn't for the sugars parties. You know, we have sweet, when I go to sport, I don't buy two tickets for me and my wife to go. I buy a suite and we take a bunch of people. We go to a concert, we take a suite, and we take a bunch of people. And it's not a money thing. It's a, a, a you know, you, I, I create great events that people will get to know each other. I see us as connectors. You know, one of our biggest jobs in life is to connect people with each other and make sure that they all become friends. And um, Well, it's, an, it's a vehicle, isn't it, to, for driving the depth of relationship. I mean, for a party, invite people around. You'd be in danger of deepening your relationships with people. I mean, we, we talked about this in our last con- one of our last conversations. Was I don't know whether this is Carnegie or some of his followers, but the secret to happiness in life is not about fame, it's not about fortune, it's about deep, lasting relationships. That's where happiness comes. Yeah, I, I, you know, happiness, uh, I also believe happiness is a choice, you know. Why are you happy? Because that's who I am. I don't, I don't need something to happen to make me happy. You know, why are you rich? Because that's who I am. I'm a rich person. Internal, external. You know, when you get, when you get wealth in your head and your heart, it, it transforms into your back pocket or, you know, that type of thing. Mm. Reach out, show up. I mean, that is two simple, actionable things to develop your own wealth, if you like. You know, when you get in your car, don't put the music on, phone somebody. When you get in the car, make a call. And they go, what are you calling for? I don't know, haven't heard heard from you in a while. Guarantee right now, people listening to this podcast, in the car, (laughs) are thinking about people who are going to call right now. And so you should. Do it. Pause this podcast. Get on and uh, maybe it'll listen to the end of it and then phone them I off. literally have reminders in my phone set weekly and monthly for people to call. Because it's like, oh, shoot, if I, if I don't remind myself, I'm going to forget. Well, uh, Life's busy. That's how got I got five kids. That's part of discipline, yeah. I mean, you go back to the... the well, pa- Siri, Siri makes me disciplined, so thank oh, you, Siri. Technology, it means oh. the power of habit. It's a cue. It's just a cue. Oh, Siri was kicking in there. Yes. Um, all right, let's go to the last one, spiritual wealth. Mm-hmm. I'm not really an expert on this one, I don't think, James. You know, I, I think there's greater theologians and scholars than I that have studied spiritual wealth a great deal more than me. I think, uh, you know, I, I, I just go back to, I love the American Indian philosophy of the great spirit. That to me is sort of, yeah, yeah, it's an interesting one. It's See, I, I reflect on that. And, uh, I've been brought up around a few spiritual people, and, and I get that I'm part of something bigger. I believe there's something bigger and greater than me. Yeah, what, what, what that is, I don't know. Well, I've yeah, never but, studied it enough. Now, I've studied business and yeah. wealth a whole bunch, but I have, I've never really sat down and studied uh, theology. So Do you know, do you know what, though? I, I get drawn to... Caring about people, looking at people, and they've got a life. They're a person. They've got some things that are going on. Yeah. And, and it just sort of a mature understanding that there's something bigger that going on in other people's lives just helps me value the moment with people there. And and even it springboards onto that social, develop even greater relationships with people. Yeah. Yeah, look, ultimately... Um is, is there something greater than all of us? Highly probable. Highly probable. You know, the fact that we are all very simply basic cells, positive and negative charged neurons, means that there is a, a, a way for us to be connected without even being connected sort of thing. The, the, the whole re- science behind that, you know, like the... If you go into like the law of attraction, the law of vibration, yeah. and all of those sorts of things, and you go into the science behind it, well, the law of attraction is simple. That you know you're a magnet at some level. You attract and repel different things based on the chemical composition, which determines the positive and negative charge neurons in your body. And um, if you want to test that, stick your finger in a wall socket. You'll see if you're positive or negatively charged. Uh, or try dying, and they'll you know, hit you with the defibs and recharge you sort of thing and get you started again. But that, the theory of us 
connecting with each other on a higher plane, I, I can't argue with. I can't teach on it, but I can't argue with it. Yeah, but does it start with caring about someone else? Oh, I, I think, you know, you go back to the word investing, you know, and you can call it caring. You can. I, I like the word investing in other people because sometimes you invest in them just by listening. Sometimes you invest in them by teaching them something. Sometimes you invest in them by, by showing them something or taking them somewhere or doing or just hanging out with them, you know, just showing up. But investing in people, investing in business, investing in all these different things, I think if, if that's, you know, something that I get known for, that I teach people to invest in whatever it is they care about, then that's a good thing. Maybe I should get Eckhart Tolle into one of these podcasts and, and just <laughs> I was, a little I was bit on more. a TV show with him in Australia many years well, ago. Well, maybe you SBS. can connect with after this then. There you go. He, he didn't wear shoes, which was kind of... We're on a TV. That's all right. I mean, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like, okay. I'll, wear shoes. Yeah, it's, I'll, let, I'll let him do that. Yeah. But, um, but, you, but you, one thing that you're big into, though, is the physical side of things. So meditation, mm -hmm. relaxation, massage. Now, that obviously is body, mind, all is one type thing. Well, if you're going to have health, health is not a complex thing on this planet. It is sunshine, air, water, whole foods, you know, massage, chiropractic, all of those things are just, it, it's very, very simple. Get away from processed products. I mean, when I was on the board of Cancer Schmancer, one of the most interesting studies that we went through was the whole cleaning products and hair products and all of the products we put on and in our body and how much carcinogenic levels are in those things and you sit there and you look at it and you go yeah that hair dye good job that that'll kill you not straight away but eventually so yeah we as a family are very clear on uh moderation but we're also very clear on the things that keep you healthy healthy mind healthy body or the other way around Healthy body, healthy mind. You know, when you sit down and start yeah, yeah. looking at it, if your body's not healthy, then your gut isn't healthy and therefore you can't have the happiness drugs kick in. So you've got to have a healthy gut in order to be happy. Do you have, do you have to be healthy to be wealthy? No. No, there's been a lot of people proving that on the planet. Rich as hell and, yeah, uh, we, and unhealthy as I mean, heck. So. We have talked about different types of What health. was the old Gandhi quote that, you know, you, the people you think you have time? It wasn't Gandhi. Who was it? It was um, uh, Buddha or um, you think you have you think you have time. You know, and that's the biggest problem with humans is you think you have time. And, and then it was um, Tibetan, what's his name? The Dalai Lama who said, you know, you... Hum you Western people intrigue me in that, uh, and I'm paraphrasing yeah. here, uh, that, you know, you spend all of your life making money and then spend all of your money to get back your life sort yeah. of thing. So it's like back you waste all of your health on that. And then there's the old story of, you know, going to Mexico and seeing the man with the fishing boat who's there with his kids and he's caught enough fish for the kids. And the American businessman says to him, you know, well, why don't you catch some more fish and then you could buy another boat and then you could build a fleet of boats and, then you could have, be really rich. And he said, why would I do that? Well, then you could bring your kids to the beach. <laughs> it's like, there's two philosophies to what's rich and what's not. Well, and I don't think, and, and this is my personal opinion, is that you can be an and, not an or. You don't, I, I see this all the time where people are so degrading of people with money they're talking down people with money because they don't have money, so therefore it must be wrong to have money. They talk down what other people have that they don't in order to suggest that that thing is wrong and what they have is correct. I'm a firm believer in and. I can have great friendships and a great business and have my employees love working with me my team will love what we do. I can have all of those things. I don't have to decide, do I want to be rich or healthy? I don't have to decide if I want to be smart or nice. I can be those things. I can choose to be an and, not an all. Choose to be an and, not an all. And as you're creating wealth in all of these areas, definitely stay on top of your health. 
So we've got a few quick questions to finish on here. Right. Got it. You ready? What's your favorite sport? Uh, ice hockey. Why ice hockey? Because you, you own a box and you invite all your uh, friends, you but, have beers. Uh, really what? fast, hard-hitting, um, and, and I know this will come across as sexist, but it's a manly sport. They're yeah. still allowed to beat the shit out of each other. It's tough. It's hard. Growing up playing rugby in Australian rules football, I love sports that are really tough and solid. And it's a team sport. I love team sports. Favorite hobby? Favorite hobby. Uh, current favorite hobby is uh, is grilling and smoking. Uh, so yeah, American grills and and barbecue and meats. Barbecue and hey. There you go. Barbecuing. It's a hobby now is barbecuing. Love oh, it. listen, my, my wife and I wanted to be good at it. We found the world champion, Myron Mixon, and we flew out and took a two-day course with Myron. Just Give to, over. Yeah. That is a serious hobby. I mean, that is a serious hobby. Well, and then hobby. we bought a massive 20-something thousand dollar two-ton smoker. I had to get oh. a 15-ton crane to lift the dang thing in. My wife now, she does it perfectly. She does uh, full hog, whole hog, smokes the whole thing. We have to invite about 150 friends over just to eat the dang thing. Favorite restaurant? My restaurant, La Cave. Why? What do you serve? A, because it's mine. Um, I mean, and my partner's. Um, my favorite restaurant is almost always a steakhouse. Almost always a steakhouse. Just in Florence, had to go and have a steak Florentine. I always enjoy having a steak with you, bro. Yeah. All right. Favorite drink? Rum. Which kind? Uh, depends on the day, but my daily drinker is Zacapa 23. They stopped making 10 cane rum, so unfortunately that's out. Zacapa 23, Diplomatico 19. Uh, that would be my two favorite daily drinkers. The Diplomatico Plano with ginger beer is a great morning cocktail, too, on, at brunch. Favorite, favorite actor or actress? Uh, Russell Crowe. Why, why Russell Crowe? Because uh, the guy lives his character. He literally does. He literally, when he's on set doing it, he lives in character for months. Does consumes Hugh person. Jackman would be right behind him. Though. Hugh Jackman's great too. Be well, because of Wolverine or because of The Greatest Showman? Uh, both. <laughs> that, his, his ability to be both is yeah. what I love about yeah. him. His... His ability to portray such different styles. Yeah. Russell's more down one genre, yeah. whereas Hugh can do the yeah. full showman and the, the Wolverine. Yeah, excellent. Favorite author? I don't think I have a favorite author. That's a really unique question. Because multiple books by the same person, rarely are they always as great as the first book by that person. Mm. There's few, isn't there? I mean, a few spring to mind in business. you got Daniel Priestley's books. He's got a sequence of pretty good books. There's yeah. At, uh, see, I would always have to go with At The Moment, Yeah. who is my favorite author. Um, and that's a really tough question, but... I'm going to go with an author most people won't understand. It's Meg Mika. Meg wrote the book uh, called Strong Father, Strong Daughter. And she also wrote another book called Heroes. Um, and it's about how to be a dad. And specifically how to be a dad. I have four daughters, so I grew up with two brothers. I had no idea how to raise a daughter. So I'm, I'm going to give Meg a great tag of, of that. There's been a lot of great books I've read, but as authors go, I like her style. Heroes was a great great read i'm really glad we held that you know there's going to be plenty of dads they're going to be going out and getting those well it's a now. crazy thing james you become a dad and people just assume you're going to learn it as you go no go and read from a dozen or two dozen other people that have been dads before you and learn about it and the crazy thing is i learned more about being a dad from a woman than i did from other dads but everyone's got advice for you on how to raise your kid and the only advice I ever have people on how to raise your kid is every kid's different. There's no, there's no one strategy that'll work with all your kids. Every kid's different. If you could go back and do it again. Do what you again? All your life. I wouldn't. you do the same. Um, yeah, I, I don't think I'd do it again. I, I don't think I'd do it differently because I love who I am. I love my family. I love my friends. I love what I get to do every day. I get to travel around the world 
Uh, I, I get people who interview me and then I get on stage and people tell me how great I am and, and then I go home and see my family and I have great business partners and you know, Marshall Goldsmith said it to me. I was just in Nashville. I ran into Marshall. We were down having a uh, hot chicken down on the broad, lower Broadway there. And, and I said, how's, how's things, Marshall? He says, you know what? I still get to travel the world. People still tell me I'm great and I still get to think about new things and teach new things every day. My life is good. You know, and that to me is is an important thing that I get to I get to do what I'm here for, my calling. I get to be with great people, uh, and I get to be rewarded for the work that I put out there into the world. So, the listeners then to encourage them to be successful off the back of this. I don't need to encourage them because they're already listening to this, so they're already encouraged, they're already inspired and motivated. What are the core one or two things that they need to do on the back of this to create wealth in their world? Uh, number one, make a list of the books you need to read. Okay. Like if you want to, oftentimes people do their learning haphazard. They read whatever comes up or whatever is the latest trend. If you want to be a real estate investor, great. Go and find the 50 best books on real estate investing and make a list and start at number one and get through all 50. Don't, don't read just haphazard. So make that list of what it is that you need to read. Number two, set up your family company or trust, that is, and then write that business plan. And get enough knowledge, keep building your knowledge until you can write that business plan, help your kids learn it, your kids are employees of that company, have board meetings every quarter with your kids, teach them what you're investing in, why you're investing in it. And it doesn't matter if that business plan takes you 10 years or one year. It's gonna take you at least three don't expect it to take a month. Expect it to take several years because you've got to gain the knowledge. Unless you've been already studying wealth for 10 years or more, it's going to take you a period of time to write that plan. Now, even if you've been studying wealth for 10 years or more and you've only studied real estate wealth, you've never studied business wealth or, or stock market wealth, then you've got two other forms to start studying it because a good portfolio is balanced. There's times when it's great to be investing in business, times when it's great to be in real estate, and times when it's not great to be in real estate. Where you don't, the banks aren't lending, there's no money, there's high interest rates. You're not buying real estate at that point in time. You're over here buying stocks, you're over here buying businesses. Write the plan. What's been your favorite part of this discussion on wealth? The fact that I learned that I'm not an expert on something and I don't want to be. Uh, my favorite part was you focusing on being a great dad, as well as clearly a great leader, clearly an entrepreneur yourself, cl cl clearly a great teacher, an educator. But the importance and you know the, the fact that you're committed to going reading them books in that other area of, of your world. Yeah, also great book, so many great books on how to be a husband too. Don't get that wrong. I've had to probably had to read more books on that subject than I did on being a dad. That one I've had to take a lot more lessons. There you go. <laughs> Thank you very much, Brad Sugars. Thank you, James Vincent.